Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. I hope you all had a nice break. Um, since this session deals with categorization of complex API and uh, formulation, so to uh, start this session, I want to first talk about the categorization and the comparative evaluation strategies for demonstrating complex API sameness. This is just a standard disclaimer, basically saying that this presentation represents the view of myself and should not be construed to represent FDA's view or policies. Uh, to begin with, I want to first talk about active ingredient sameness for generic drug. And then I will talk about the characterization strategy for complex injectable API. And then I will spend most of my time giving you two examples to further uh, illustrate uh, those strategies. As we know, by regulation, generic drug must be therapeutically equivalent to the reference listed drug, uh, which we also call RD. What therapeutic equivalent mean? It means basically the first is pharmaceutical equivalent, and then it need to be bi-equivalent to the reference standard. And then the generic drug must be adequately labeled. And last but not the least, generic drug must be manufactured in compliance with the CGMP regulation. So as you can see, the pharmaceutical equivalent is the very first requirement for the generic drug. But what pharmaceutical equivalent mean? It means the generic drug must contain the same API to the reference laser drug. The generic drug must use the same uh, dosage form and rod administration. The generic drug must have the same strength or concentration of the API. Also, the generic drug must meet the same compendial standard for strength, uh, quality, purity, and identity. So from here, you can see basically API sameness is a requirement for generic drugs. When we talk about API, we can generally divide those into two categories. One is a simple API. The other is called complex API. Simple API basically means small molecules with defined structures, or in some cases, a mixture of a few small molecules in a fixed ratio. For complex API, it may include like peptide, natural polymers, or synthetic polymers, or heterogeneous mixtures of molecules, or micromolecular uh, complexes. So when we talk about complex injectable API, here are some of the examples, like peptide, for example, uh, terapeptide or glucagon, synthetic oligonucleotide, like nucinosin, those uh, several new drugs approved recently. The naturally derived mixtures like uh, soybean oil from plant or uh, heparin from poison, or the semi-synthetic mixtures, for example, the enoxaparin, which is derived from chemical depolarization of heparin ester. The synthetic compact mixtures like uh, the famous glutamyl acetate. Last but not the least, iron complex, for example, the iron sucrose. So in general, when we talk about complex API sameness, the way we recommend how to demonstrate that sameness is to use a totality of evidence approach. Basically, you need to consider the following area and make sure they are equivalent in each of the area. The first is the source of starting material. And then you need to look at the reaction scheme, make sure they are equivalent. And next area is the structure signature analysis for complex mixtures. And also, the physical, chemical, and biological evaluation, and sometimes uh, the impurity profile analysis. So to apply those principles for the complex injectable API, the characterization strategy looks like this. First, you need to confirm the structure or provide a structure signature analysis for complex mixtures. For example, if you have peptide or synthetic oligonucleotide, you need to provide the primary sequence of those products. If you have complex mixture, you need to provide the fingerprinting of those structures and also distribution of the mixture. After that, you need to do the comparative physical chemical property analysis. For example, the molecular weight distribution in a mixture, the spectroscopic analysis. 
In some cases, you also need to provide comparative impurity profile analysis. For example, in the synthetic peptide, you need to analyze the peptide-related impurities. For synthetic oligonucleotide, you need to analyze those N plus 1, N minus 1, and some other impurities. In some other cases, you also need to provide comparative biological activity evaluation. Those are more like confirmative in nature, basically include in which or all in vivo uh, studies. So um, to further illustrate this point, I want to just spend most of my time to give you two examples to talk about this uh, point. The first example is a semiconstantonin, which is a peptide. The second example I'm going to talk about is inox carrying sodium, which is a low molecule weight happen. So let's first talk about the uh, semiconstantonin case. Semiconstantonin belongs to a class of compound called peptide. By the agency's definition, peptide is any alpha amino acid polymers with defined sequence of 40 amino acids or fewer in size. For the peptide, we do not have any specific guidance on the injectable peptide product, but we did publish a draft guidance in 2017 on the under summation of certain highly purified synthetic peptide referencing the recombinant DNA peptide as a reference product. Even though that guidance only covers five peptide products, the general characterization principles and strategies may be considered when you develop other peptide products. So to characterize a product, I just talk about those high-level characterizations. First, certainly, you need to get the primary sequence and also amino acid composition. You also need to analyze the physical chemical properties, like optical rotation and other properties. You need to analyze the API secondary structure in the product and also the oligomer aggregation state of the API in the product. You also need to provide the biological activities, for example, the in vitro activities sometimes in animal studies. Most importantly, I want to emphasize is the impurity profile analysis, uh, which includes the peptide-related impurities and uh, some other impurities as well. So um, the key here is to use orthogonal analytical method to analyze the peptide. Since the first several bullet points is pretty uh, routine and straightforward for peptide uh, scientists, so I would only spend my time focusing on the impurity profile analysis in my example. So for semiconstantonin, we know it's a 32 amino acid peptide hormone used for the treatment of postmenopause hospital process. And in the past several years, FDA already approved several semiconstantonin products using either recombinant DNA peptide or synthetic peptide as an API. Several years ago, FDA lab uh, initiated a research project to analyze the peptide-related impurity in those semiconstantonin nasal spray product using both data-dependent acquisition and the data-independent acquisition approach. So the instrument we use um, are the UPLC MS system. The mass spectrometer includes the uh, thermal orbit trap and the waters QTOF systems. The goal for those studies are uh, basically uh, threefold. One is to identify those peptide impurity that can be observed in the total ion chromogram, the TIC. And then the second group of the impurity will be those co eluting with the API or at the peak trail. API, which it will be difficult for manual screening. And the third group of impurity will be those uh, below the uh, TIC baseline. Here I'll just show you some of the results from the analysis of one of the uh, peptide samples. On the left hand side, if you look at the um, slide, it shows you the uh, DIA study result. You can see the DIA study can identify many peptide-related impurities here, like 28 total. And uh, you can see the API in this system is looted at 28.7 minutes retention time. And if you look at the table, there are six peptide-related impurities also eluting at the same time. 
basically means that the DIA study can allow you to detect peptide impurity co eluting with the API. On the upper right hand side, uh, it's a result from a DDA study. We can preset criteria in the DDA studies to identify or detect peaks that you won't be able to see in the TIC trace. So, for example, in this case, the uh, impurity is eluted at 29.2 minutes. You won't be able to see a peak in the TIC because it's buried under the peak trail of the API, which is roughly eluted at around 28 minutes. But through DDA, we can still identify these peptide impurities. On the lower right hand side, I show you a table of peptide impurities that are identified through the TIC approach. Some of the low abundance uh, peaks, we won't be able to do that through DDA, but through TIC, we can still see that. If you look at the bottom two uh, peptide impurities, those are singularly charged peptide impurity. But in the DDA study, we predefined the charge state from plus two to plus five. So that's why we won't be able to see that through DDA, but in the TIC study, we can identify those peptide impurities. So combining those approaches together, we can get a better picture on the peptide impurity in the sample. So using the same approach, we actually analyzed 13 nasal spray products, both from the recombinant DNA API or the, from the synthetic uh, peptide API. Overall, we have over 100 peptide impurity detected by this method. And uh, four of those uh, about 0.5%, and uh, 16 were about 0.1%. So ex this example just basically show you for the peptide impurity analysis, the comparative evaluation is critical. The uh, reason is we want to ensure the impurity will not affect the safety and efficacy of the uh, generic drug product. So if you have peptide impurity that exists in both the, com uh, the generic and the RLD, generally we recommend the level in the generic should not be higher and those found in the RD. If you have new impurities in the generic, that you need to characterize and also identify those impurities once the level is above certain threshold. And once you have new impurity, you also need to study the immunogenicity risk, which include the in silico, in vitro uh, method. Because the time limit, I won't go into detail on those, but we just put that as an important part of the impurity profile analysis. So now I just want to shift gear to talk about a second uh, example, the low molecule weight heparin. We know enoxaparin is an anticoagulant um, product that derived from pulsing heparin through uh, chemical depolarization of the heparin esters. If you look at the structure on the left-hand side, there's a double bound in the structure, which is a characteristic of enoxaparin. Also, enoxaparin contains many disaccharide building blocks. And on the right-hand side of the structure, most of the component has a hydroxy group. We also call a reducing end of the molecule. But roughly the 20% of the component contains the so-called 1,6 hydro derivative, which is also part of the enoxaparin mixture. The average molecular weight is 4,500, uh, with a range from 2,000 to 8,000. So apparently, enoxaparin is a mixture uh, of different molecules. So to demonstrate API signals for these complex mixtures, the key is to run a comparative structure signature analysis. So in our product-specific guidance, we recommend structure fingerprinting analysis, which include the oligo saccharide composition, the sequence of the oligosaccharide, the uh, disaccharide building blocks, and also the fragment mapping of the enzymatic uh, cleavage. So all those studies basically involve very extensive chromatographic separation, also the mass spec uh, 1D, 2D MR studies. Here, I just want to show you one possible approach to address these complex issues. This is a, a method that published in a paper in a journal. 
I want to just emphasize again, this doesn't represent that the agency's endorsement of this approach, but rather I want to use as an example in this talk to show you how to think about addressing a complex issues. As we know, in aspirin sodium can bind antisorbing. So this team use antisorbing affinity chromatography to separate the inox pairing into low affinity component and also high affinity component. For the low affinity component, they use a GPC to further separate those by size into different fractions, which contain tetrasaccharide, some contain the hexasaccharide, all the way to tetradecasaccharide. And then after anion exchange chromatography, you can study each fraction use MR. So the same thing can be done on the high affinity component. Here to show you um, a example of one of the samples. On the left hand side is a GPC chromogram of the high affinity, which is the thin line, and the low affinity, which is the thick line of the inox pairing. And you can see they have pretty good separation from the far right the tetrasaccharide and then hexasaccharide all the way to tetradecasaccharide. So once you can separate those fractions, you can analyze each fraction with MRs, like 1D and 2D MR. So on the right hand side, I show you two 2D MRs from two different samples, which contains the tetradecasaccharide. But you can see those uh, 2D MR looks very similar, except uh, those circled um, here in the linker region. So there's some differences there. But this basically provides you a, a possible approach to analyze the RD and also your generic product and compare the similarity and differences between the RD and the generic. This team also uses hyperness to further depolarize the inox pairing and get different fractions and then use the strong anion exchange chromatography to separate those fractions and uh, analyze those different fragments. They can also analyze different samples from different manufacturers and see the similarity and also difference between those samples. Uh, you can see here, um, in general, it looks very similar, but in the first part, you do see some difference uh, in those fragments. So once you finish those comparative structure analysis, other characterization studies you need to perform to fully demonstrate the API sameness include the physical chemical property analysis, for example, the overall composition, the spectroscopic data, and some USP tests as well. Here you also need to do the biological activity evaluation, uh, like in vitro anti-factor 10A activity, at a factor 10A and 2A ratio. Uh, we also recommend the in vivo PD studies uh, in this case. So combining all those studies together, we call it a totality of evidence approach. So it's not like a single approach. It's a combination of different methods. So just in summary, I hope that uh, in this short period of time, I show you that for complex API, we can still demonstrate API synthesis through a comprehensive totality of evidence approach. But for each individual case, they have different challenges. So you need to evaluate each individual situation and then apply the principle accordingly. For example, in the southern Constantinian case, like any peptide, the peptide-related impurity analysis is very critical. For complex mixtures like inoxparin, you need to perform the comparative structure signature analysis. That's an important part of the API synthesis demonstration. So I hope in this like 20 minutes or so, I just show you, uh, you know, the strategies and how to approach this to demonstrate compact API sameness. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the management in OGD for their support and my colleague in OPQ for their uh, nice work for the uh, seven constituting studies. Uh, thank you for your attention.